Coming up next, join us as we talk to Jerry and Kathy Oltian about science fiction, science fantasy, making telescopes, making and flying kites. Uh, this is our second section, so please see the description box below if you want to know more about what we talked about the first time. We're so happy to have the two of you back again joining us. It's Thanks for having us. Yes, happy to be back. Right, great to have you. Um, and so we wanted to talk about all your various hobbies and maybe how you bring those into your writing, if you just want to touch on that a little. But let's start. What do you want to start with, Elizabeth? Well, I thought I would say Jerry is a regular for Sky and Telescope magazine, and he writes a column for them once a week featuring homemade astronomy equipment. And I wondered if you could tell us about how did you get into making telescopes? How do you write a, you know, everything? Just tell us all about this. How did you get into this amazing? All at once. Amazing, okay. And yeah, and don't forget, guys, there are links below to some of their astro photos and telescopes, which are quite amazing, as well as their kites. Indeed. Okay. The, the thing about, you know, when you're sort of a scientifically minded person, there are so many cool hobbies out there that you can do uh, way, way more than you have time for. Uh, but one of the things that's always interested me, and Kathy as well, uh, has been astronomy. Uh, but we didn't actually own a telescope until, what was it? 2003. 2003 at Christmas. We couldn't figure out what to buy <clears throat> each other for a Christmas present. So we thought, well, let's just buy something together for the two of us. And we decided to buy a telescope. And that was the rabbit hole that we fell all the way down. <laughs> and, uh, it turns out there are groups in nearly every town, astronomy clubs of amateur astronomers. And I have to say the word amateur astronomer just means people who love astronomy. It comes from Amur. Um, but there are professional astronomers in our astronomy club, you know, guys that worked at Kitt Peak and, uh, you know, um, one of the guys that was responsible for finding the distance to the moon by shooting laser beam at the moon and, let, and watching it bounce back. He's a member of my astronomy club, right? Wow. And so you join this club and you're suddenly in contact with people who know an awful lot about astronomy and <clears throat> including how to build a telescope, how to actually take two pieces of glass, lay one on top of the other with grit in between and grind them back and forth until you wind up with a little bit of a concave surface and that's your telescope mirror. Um, and uh, you know, so I learned how to grind a, a mirror to make an, a reflecting telescope. And then of course you have to learn how to build the structure to hold the mirror and the secondary mirror and the eye focuser and the eyepieces all in the proper place. And, uh, you know, and then you have to learn how to use it and how to, where things are in the sky, what things to look for. How do you, how do you have any idea how to, how, how to make it, you know, what the right concave shape will be? You, you measure, uh, in fact, um, Kat, can we pause the video for just a second? <laughs> okay, grab that mirror off the wall. Okay. I, I forgot, I have, a, I have a telescope mirror. So let's just do this. Now the mirror is the 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 le first lens is the part you grind, right? Well, actually, I telescopes can either use lenses or mirrors, and mirrors are a lot easier. So I do mirrors, not lenses. You got it. Okay. okay. Why are they easier? So un unpause the video. We'll give a second. <laughs> okay, Kathy has just taken down off the wall a mirror that I uh, keep just. For reference, <laughs> there's my neighbor's house across the street. <laughs> this is the mirror that I made, and it's a big old slab of glass. And you can tell it's just ever so slightly concave. Grab that ruler right over there. And without scratching the mirror, I can lay this ruler across. And you can see that's how concave it is. And you measure the depth of that curve. And oh, that's eerie. <laughs> <laughs> kind of creepy, yeah. <laughs> also, this works as a Halloween scare tactic as well. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. So yeah. But how do you how do you have any how do you know how how to 
there's how, a how? there's a mathematical formula that tells you how, what your focal length will be you know, from the mirror up to the focal point uh, depending on the depth of the curve and so you decide okay i want my telescope say to be a one meter focal length um, and i know my mirror is 10 inches in diameter so that means i need to dig my curve down oh it's probably about an eighth of an inch is how deep it would go uh, but yeah there's a formula that you use to calculate that out and it's a pretty simple formula um you know you can just pop it into a calculator and figure it out oh, elizabeth were, it's out it's out of our math realm oh <laughs> well, it's definitely out of our math realm definitely but i'm just yeah. curious could you also make a, a microscope using microscopes use lenses and they use very very tiny lenses and lenses are really hard to grind. Um, I've never ground a lens. You know, the nice thing about a mirror is there's just one surface that you need to work on that's silvered on the front, not on the back. And so there's just one surface that you need to, uh, to uh, grind to any kind of mathematical per, uh, perfection. So Whereas with a lens, you've got two surfaces, right? And typically a lens is a, it has multiple elements. And so you might have a lens that's shaped like this and then another lens that's convex on the outside and and you know and they have to mate and oh it's way way harder so i've never done a lens the um, mirror that you showed us the mirror i'm a little confused um the mirror mirror usually is on the back like you said and usually if you were to grind a mirror surface you would lose the silver so well, what happens work? yeah what happens is this this starts out as just a piece of glass Okay. Um, you know, big round thick piece of glass and you grind on the top surface and you you get your surface ground down to the curve that you want and then you use finer and finer grits to smooth it back out and um, then you aluminize it you put it in a vacuum chamber and you vaporize aluminum and the aluminum sticks to the surface and so it's called a front surface mirror because this front surface is the reflective part uh, and it's um, aluminum um and i don't you know i didn't want to build my own vacuum chamber and all that so i sent that off to be done um, i was going to ask you about yeah. that people do that i mean this is where the science geekery gets really fun you know people build their own vacuum chambers and illuminize their own mirrors um and we've just recently learned how to uh, coat them with silver uh which is kind of interesting in that in the old days that was the only way to do it and then when aluminizing came along, um, aluminum doesn't tarnish the way silver does. And so that became the standard. And we basically forgot how to do silver. Uh, I mean, it's not like we as a society forgot, but uh, amateur astronomers quit silvering mirrors. And only recently, um, um, we've got a, a group of people that are building mirrors that are so large that they won't fit in the aluminizing chambers anymore. And so they're learning to re or the relearning how to silver mirrors and uh, so this is kind of cool old technology have you silver yeah. mirrors you don't need a chamber no with silvering it's just you spray on uh, chemicals that uh, uh, precipitate silver out onto the surface and so it doesn't need to be done in a chamber so yeah the old technology is coming back into use because mirrors are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they won't fit in the chambers anymore so that's so kind of cool what about on the Hubble telescope or something? Um, well, the Hubble's out in space, um, and so it won't tarnish. I I don't know if they aluminized it or silvered it. To be honest, I, I suspect it was aluminized. Um, but um, you know, they do. You know, commercially, you can get enormous vacuum chambers, and you can do the aluminizing. But for an amateur, the cost would be prohibitive to have them do a mirror. Or, you know, they charge you a hundred thousand dollars just to pump the air out of the chamber. You know. <laughs> so, so, would you show us? I think you've got pictures to show us. Or yeah, a yeah. So, here. would you show it? I'd love uh, to yeah, see. let me share my screen here, and I'll show you uh, some um, pictures of uh, my first, uh, well, my my most recent telescope, and the the most difficult one that I have built to date. Yeah. You, okay. You getting that? Not yet. Yeah. There, there it is. There we go. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's okay. Cool. So this is this is a travel telescope uh, that um, it is. Uh, I don't know. Can you see my my arrow here? Is it yeah. moving around? Yes. Yeah. And how big is this? 
Okay, this is a nine and a half inch diameter mirror. Um, the one that I was holding up uh, was a 10 inch. So it's very similar to the one I was holding up. And it's a one meter focal length. This is a one meter away from, from that, about 39 inches. And there's a secondary mirror here that bounces the light out to an eyepiece there. And uh, this telescope is designed to collapse down. All the, all the pieces uh, come apart and collapse down and fit into a box that I can carry on an airplane. Um, these trusses are actually screwed together in three pieces and you can unscrew them. So, um, oh, wow. yeah. And so there's the, there's the box that it fits in. The entire telescope fits in that box. And wow. I've, I've uh, put a, a beer bottle and a can of uh, pop next to it. So you can see kind of the scale. Is it um, heavy? Is it? It's quite <laughs> heavy, yeah. Um, that, that box weighs, what, 20, 22 pounds, something like that. It's, it's quite heavy. <laughs> Um, but this is the no. sort of stuff, you know, this is not your first time telescope building project. I would not recommend that anybody build something like this at their first go because I had, I had to pretty much apply everything I knew about telescope making uh, and learn quite a bit of new stuff to make this work. Uh, one of the now, things do you, are you doing these only for yourself or do you, are you doing them and selling them? Is that, is that part of the hobby? I'm just doing them for myself. Um, I have not yet sold a, a homemade telescope. I've given a couple away, um, but I've always felt that if you try and turn a hobby into a business, you're going to wreck your hobby. And, sure. you know, and in, in a way, my writing hobby kind of became a business and, and it became less fun when I was trying to make money with it. Um, I, I'm no longer trying to worry about the money. So writing is now fun again. But uh, yeah, I didn't want to do that with uh, astronomy. So I just make them for fun. And of course, you the problem do do is- a, You do write a column once a month though. I do. And this is the thing. Once I started down this path, let's see, I think I might have one more photo. Yeah, there's the, the stuff packed in the box. Um, you know, the mirror and the trusses uh, collapse down and then the secondary cage and all that. But once I started building my own telescopes, um, there, there was a column in Sky and Telescope magazine run by a guy named Gary Soronic, uh, where he was doing essentially what I'm doing now. And I would send him pictures and descriptions of what I'd done, and he would write about my telescopes and publish them in Sky and Telescope magazine. And then when he finally decided to retire, he got a hold of me and he said, well, you know, most... <laughs> Most of my columns are about your telescopes anyway. Why don't you just take over the column? Right? <laughs> and so I inherited Gary's column, but you know, you very quickly run out of your own projects. And so I now solicit other people to send me their projects and I write about those. And now are you always, uh, sorry, but are you writing about um, like building tele telescope, how to design and build the telescope? Or are you saying, oh, well, this was discovered, this, you know, are you, how much of which do you do? Do you incorporate are, them? It, it's, almost, it's almost exclusively talking about what people have built, you know, um, new innovations that they've come up with, uh, different ways of doing things. Um, right now, 3D printing is uh, becoming a major deal. And so um, I've got a column coming up here. I think it's going to be in the January issue uh, about, uh, a telescope that's almost entirely 3D printed. You know, you, you still have to come up with a mirror. You can't print the mirror, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, all of the support structure is 3D printed. And, you know, that's something 10 years ago, nobody would have even considered doing. Could you print uh, like the, so you, not the mirror, but the glass that's gonna be coated. Could you, could you print a surface that's, so you could design it to be the right concaveness and then? Can't do that what? yet. Um, you know, for one thing, the, the the material that you print with can only be plastic. It has to be meltable, and uh, so you couldn't. Um, there's there's all sorts of uh, uh, tricks that we keep people keep trying in order to uh, eliminate the process of grinding a mirror. You know, they they try and spin cast it so that the curve is thrown out by centripetal force. Slump it. They slump it over, you know, put it in a kiln on a mold that's got the right curve and they <laughs> slump the glass down over it. All of these things are done in an effort to avoid having to grind out the mirror. 
And it's like, I'm only grinding an eighth of an inch or so out of this mirror. It's like, it's not that hard. Um, so I'm kind of a naysayer when it comes to all these other uh, techniques to try and eliminate 20 hours worth of work. You know, it's like, let's just, just do the work. <laughs> so uh, no, I've, I've got I friends. Wonder, that, because go they can print now with, with like skin cells and stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure that somebody will eventually develop a way of printing with glass or printing with something that's as rigid as glass. Uh, you know, as long as you're coating the front surface of it, it doesn't matter what the surface is, as long as it stays rigid enough. Uh, and that's the thing, the telescope mirror cannot flex more than a quarter wavelength of light over its entire surface. If it flexes more than that, uh, it'll destroy the focused image. The image will be blurred. And so that's why the glass has to be so thick. It's that thick in order to keep from flexing. Uh, when you know when you tilt the telescope, the mirror changes its position, and in, in order to keep it from flexing, um, got to be really stiff. And uh, now this is why the James Webb Telescope, where the mirrors are made out of beryllium, and uh, beryllium is a really hard, stiff metal, uh, and so they could they could make those mirrors pretty stiff while keeping the thickness low and that way the weight was not so heavy and they they you know we had to launch this thing into space so we needed to keep it as light as possible and that's why they use beryllium and uh, you know i don't want to touch beryllium with a 10-foot pole because it's toxic so i'm not going to make a beryllium mirror <laughs> i'm using window glass <laughs> you just shoot that toxic stuff in space that's right, yeah. right. So, uh, Wow. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of the astronomy hobby, uh, you know. So cool. I know I'm dying to know more about Kathy's knitting hobby because I oh. knit too. I don't oh, knit. I, we saw, yeah, we saw a little bit of what you do. I don't knit anything that interesting, so I really want to talk about your knitting. Well, sure. Absolutely. And I'm fascinated because now, are you? Was it your idea where it's like I'm going to incorporate my science and my knitting, sort of, or did you? It was. It's an idea that's floating around already. There's there's so many scientific minded people uh, who do knit and crochet, um, and we meet on a website called Ravelry, and you can find all these different groups, all these different people. And uh, so uh, you know, you you kind of gravitate toward you know people who have the same kind of interests. And um, I started you know playing around in a competi competition called um nerd wars <laughs> and and we we developed teams based on mostly on like science fiction shows stuff like that i became the captain of the um babylon 5 team uh you know i was going to do star trek but you know we already had a bazillion people there and someone said oh what about babylon 5 and i'm like yes yes i love babylon 5 let's do that uh so you know, you get these people who have these scientific ideas and, and, you know, these interests, and they just kind of start becoming part of your, of your hobby. Um, so, you know, there are people who are knitting scarves, you know, with the Fibonacci sequence, for instance. Uh, what I've done so far, I've, I have a, an interest in uh, climate uh, science, and so I did a temperature scarf we yeah, we can do sideways. Um, temperature scarf, and I took the high and low temperatures every day from the year 2020, and I assigned colors to you know each 10 degrees, and then I started knitting. Uh, so two stripes per day, and then the white stripe is the uh, month, you know, break between the months. So we got January and February, March, April. We're starting to see some warm oranges in there. Uh, May is starting to get warmer June into July, where it's starting to get pretty darn hot. Very mm -hmm. few green stripes there. August and September, all the way back into our nice, cool, wet Oregon temperatures. Wow. Wow. It'd be really cool to do, you know, have like 10 years of or 20 years of knitted scarves hanging. Yeah, side know. by side. Let's let's see what, you know, what where are we going? Are you know just to kind of demonstrate we definitely are getting warmer in the summers and, oh. and more chaotic uh, you know, weather. So that was one of the things I did. And then there was another one. 
And, and you, you told us that you've done your, you did 2021 and you're doing 2022. So she's on I, her I, way, Elizabeth. Right. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've got those two in progress. I haven't finished them yet, but I have the data and I'm, you know, getting them going. So in my copious spare time. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, uh, a scarf that's demonstrating the spectra of the element iron. And so if you atomize iron and analyze its spectra, you end up with wow. this particular set of stripes. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. So, and I picked iron because iron has one of the more interesting spectra. It has, you know, it has emission lines in all of the uh, various color frames. So. Yeah, if, you, if you pick sodium, there'd just be one yellow line. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of boring. <laughs> I think that that might be my knitting project. I'll pick sodium. There you go. <laughs> I might be able to just do that. And just do anything that needs to be in a triangle, because that's what happened when I tried to knit. I think you're supposed to add something to make it square, and I didn't, and I ended up uh, with a big triangle. <laughs> hey, you know, you know, triangle is a geometric, you know, shape. So there you go. More, more science. And there's also, I'm thinking if you did the science scarves and then eventually you put them all together so they were like a big comforter, but by that time it'll be so warm that nobody will be able to be. I don't want that. <laughs> that would be sad. It would it? be very sad. Very, yeah. very sad. But, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, it's just, you know, um, and, and, you know, the knitting, uh, you know, advances itself toward things like, um, and I'm not sure where it's at, but I actually have knitted a triple. Um, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Stormy, you know, has taken that off somewhere. Yeah, it's just probably <laughs> for hers. But well, you uh, need more than one triple. Come on, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole triple, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I guess Stormy, Stormy, Stormy put a with with Stormy had been in the Star Trek, there wouldn't have been a trouble with tribbles because she would have just you know eaten the first oh, one. Just that's, that's right. right. You got the first one. That's right. No problem there at all. It'd be the trouble so. with Stormy's digestion instead. That's yeah, right. <laughs> but the other thing uh, that's kind of fun with with the knitting is that we actually I, I'm a competitive knitter. Uh, there are a very you know, a variety of um, sock knitting competitions. Uh, the one that's probably the most intense is one that starts in uh, in the winter in February, uh, where people from all over the world, and I think last year we had over 2,000 competitors, um, they, they compete to knit socks the fastest. And <laughs> yeah, first off, you start off in a team. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> this is what gets me going at times, yeah. But uh, you know, so you, you have to knit a, a sock that's a qualifier. And they you know, have to be a certain size, like feet. They know, have, like there there so, has to be a minimum size. Uh, there like, are people I, who- Like baby sock. Look, oh, I'm like, it has to be an adult size sock, uh, mm -hmm. nine inches uh, in length on the foot at the minimum. Um, and there's, you know, the, these patterns are patterns that have not been seen before. They actually have designers who, you know, they're, they're trying to get the, the craziest things into a pair of socks they can just to make people slow down. And, uh, but yeah, so you, you have to qualify. And then once you're qualified, then uh, by your, you know, already admitted, um, you know, how much time you have to spend at work or taking care of the kids or, um, or if you're retired and you have all day um, and you can knit like crazy, you get put on teams with people of your, you know, same speed. Right. Oh, and then, cool. yeah, and then what happens is that um, you're given two weeks, you know, they, they'll um, give everybody uh, access to the pattern. And that, at that point, you, um, you start knitting and you might start off with 40 people on your team. But you know, there's only going to be 35 at the end. There's only spots for 35 people. So five people are not going to make it on to the next round. And then, you know, if you make it to the first round, then you go to the second round, and you know, there's only going to be you know 25 people that time. And so it gets more and more intense. The the obvious fastest of the group, you know, starts rising to the top. <laughs> and all the teams are doing this. They're all you know losing their you know competitors as they go. Till you get to the last round where there's only one person in each team, and now you're competing against everybody else. Wow. And everybody's competing and, against 
Finland because the Finnish knitters seem to be the ones that knit the fast. I think they're born knitting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're also, I mean, I imagine you're doing accuracy too. I mean, it's not just speed, it's accuracy. Absolutely, Absolutely uh, yes. And how many pairs of socks do you end up with by the end? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you can do yeah, it, well, and there's <laughs> the thing too, is that, you know, for the really fast people, uh, once your your set of socks uh, has been accepted, and you're right, accuracy is is everything. You have to ha show exactly how many repeats of a pattern or how many you know stitches across that you've done before you're accepted. Once you're accepted, these people give you another pattern to do in the meantime while you're waiting for everybody else to finish. So oh, some God. people end up with probably as either sometimes like 16 pairs of socks by the time they're done in, in about three you know, three or four months time. <laughs> that is so tiny and, and the round, the knitting in the round and those tiny little stitches, are you blind? <laughs> well, I have discovered I, I, it's easier if I do use reading glasses, but that's more a factor of age than anything else. But um, right now I'm, I'm working on a, a sock. Ooh. So um, yeah, it's yeah. I now. Use, is that did they dictate to you the colors or or, no. or the pattern? Just the pattern. Um, just, just the pattern. pattern. Just the pattern. Right. The colors. The colors are strictly up to me. Um, and this one, I I saw this pattern. I thought, okay, that's going to look nice in self striping yarn. So the the yarn itself actually has Stripe. all the colors in it. Oh. Okay. And now, what uh, do you so, do with all the socks, though? That's a lot of socks. It is a lot of socks. I'll show you what she does with some of them. <laughs> See if I can do this. <laughs> there we go. Ah, yes, there you have it. Oh. Every now and then, she knits a large pair for me. And I'll tell you what, they are oh. they are comfy, comfy, comfy. Do <laughs> they, they wear like iron? Yeah, I've never are they worn all a wool? pair out. What was the are question? Wool? Yes. Oh. Wool. Yes. Uh, well, there's wool. Um, yeah, and then some of them have nylon to, you know, for uh, increased strength. Um, and then some of them actually have wool and then like some other fibers like bamboo or cashmere or, you know, silk. Nice. So, yeah, but generally wool, I like working with wool the best because it's got a lot of give. You work with cotton, you know, yeah. there's not a lot of stretch in it and your hands get tired very quickly. Do you ever, have you ever knit a, a cover for a telescope? I haven't yet. <laughs> it's a lot of knitting. It's a lot of knitting. Actually, there, you know, that, that does remind me, there is a pattern that, that somebody has, has designed and it's essentially a star map of the Northern wow. Hemisphere. And Ooh, wow. yeah, they have, they have little beads for all of the major stars of all the, the uh, constellations. Wow. Oh, that'd be a lot of black. It'd be a lot of black. Yeah, but that sounds yeah. really neat, wouldn't it? You, know what? it's beautiful. I mean, you should tell them about yarn bombing, though. The idea. Oh, oh I love yeah. yarn bombing. Yarn yes, bombing. You've done yarn yeah, it's really cool. It is no, fun. No, but I just think it's the coolest thing. Absolutely. You know, you got, it. it works. It works the best if you, you know, for me to use the uh, the inexpensive, um, you know, plasticky acrylic yarn because it's mm -hmm. going to hold up under the weather but you're going to knit stuff and put it around things like you know uh, fences or you know I saw somebody who you know yarn bombed a bicycle um, or a Volkswagen bus right completely wait, so wait, maybe you need to give me a little uh, for those of us okay, not so, to know about yarn bombing so, give me I'll, <laughs> so I have a question and I'll, I'll about it because I've never done it I've just admired it um do you take the bicycle, you go, I'm going to yarn bomb that. So you do the whole yarn bomb and then you put it on the bicycle or sometimes groups of people do it, right? That's right. And yarn bomb. Is it okay, a so now let's let like describe it. Okay. It's like a condom for whatever you're making. No. <laughs> it's like a yarn condom of, no. But um, yeah, basically it's a cover. Kids but don't try that. the yarn condom at home. Is that right? <laughs> I Especially guess, in the you, know, you, you knit it around the tubing or the bike. Either knit it around the tubing, or what you can do is knit it flat and then sew it, you know, seam it up in oh, the awesome. inside. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing a bike, though, do you do the wheels or do you have to do every right? single spoke? Uh, it, that's up to the artist's idea. You know, some people are crazy and will actually do each individual spoke. Um, personally, I would do like, uh, like a doily sort of a thing. 
and then attach it to the spokes yeah. that way. And then, you know, have another knitted uh, piece that goes around the tire and then attach everything that way. Everyone should look it up because it's awesome. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I've seen pretty people amazing. do trees. Yeah, yeah, whole tree, trees. Then, you know. Trees. Yeah. Road signs, gotcha. things like that. Road signs. <laughs> and if it's out yeah. there, if it's, if it's you know, sits still for very long, it, it can be arm bombed. Trees. Wow, <laughs> yes. like leaves and stuff. That's incredible. But mostly the mostly the branches. Yeah, just yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. want to kill the tree. Right. Very, <laughs> very cool. It, it's mostly just you know uh, what, what would you call it? Sudden art. You know, yeah. it just appears one day and it's like people would it's go. Like, oh, why can't I think of it right now? When uh, mob, um, what's it called? When people flash sing mob. suddenly, oh, flash yeah. mob. It's like a yeah. flash mob for yarn people. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's exactly right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love really that. Cool. That's great. Well, it's like Christo's knitted fence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can do that. <laughs> I like that. So I wanted to ask you also about another hobby of yours, which is kite making and flying. And, oh, yes. and I'm also curious, do you ever incorporate knit pieces into that? Oh, or or telescopes, time. actually. Little <laughs> telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, okay, no I guess not. The yeah. answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the thing about kite flying, you know, everybody, I would hope anyway, has, you know, stuck a kite up in the air with this little single string and you walk around and pull the kite behind you, you know. Um, and for years that we, we had a little teeny parasail that we kept in a bag and we'd have it in the car with us. And when we'd go out to the coast, we'd run it up in the air and, you know, we'd walk down the beach with the kite. And then, uh, we saw somebody flying a kite that he could steer, you know, he could swoop it around this way and that. I was like, oh, I want that. And Kathy bought me one for Christmas or birthday or what have you. And uh, we learned to fly this steerable kite. And it turns out it's not that difficult. It's actually fairly simple. Um, it, you, you know, you have two lines, you got a, a, a handle in either hand and you steer it by pushing and pulling one way or the other. And it swoops around the sky. And uh, so we got pretty good at that. And uh, one of my astronomy friends said, well, you know, they make four line kites where, you know, you can, you can make the kite go up and down and sideways and, you know, you can, you can land it and take it off and, you know, four lines, you, you can fly this kite. And uh, he gave me a four line kite that he had built. And, uh, you know, I had to learn how to fly it. And uh, being a homemade kite, it was not like, technically perfect and so it crashed a lot <laughs> and, and you it learn is. you learn more by by wrecking something than you do by just doing it perfectly the first time right so uh you know we both of us learned how to fly that kite and then uh, it, it was like okay we want uh we want one that actually flies well uh so <laughs> let's see i'm gonna i'm gonna share my screen and show you some of the kites we've done and uh, let's see share here share that and go okay so that's the uh that's the last of the deals okay so here's a kite that we made and we made it out of tyvek the the same stuff that postal envelopes are made out of the really strong stuff that you can't tear um we got a big sheet of tyvek and we made this kite and um, you can't see the four strings going up to it but you know, there are strings attached on basically the four outer points, like actually here and here and over here and here. And then we got these long tails that kind of sweep out behind it and make it look pretty. And of course, since we live in Eugene and we wear tie dye all the time, we painted it up like a tie dye shirt. <laughs> and what we did not realize until we got it up in the air and everybody started cracking up is it looks like somebody lost their bikini and it's floating around up there oh, in the air. It, it really does. <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly what that kite reminds everybody of when it's up in the air. Um, here's a picture of, of Kathy flying it. And you can see, you know, you've got these handles with these four lines going up. And by pulling on one or another, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, manip manipulating a puppet, I suppose. Uh, you pull on a certain line and it makes that part of the kite pull forward and it generates more lift um, or, or it generates more drag on the bottom. And so the kite can zoom around this way and that. And, uh, you know, that first kite we built was a great success and we still have it. We still fly it a lot. And 
this is a commercial version of the uh, the same concept, and uh, you know, much better designed than my own, and it's really really maneuverable. People fly these things in tandem. They'll get a dozen of these together, and they'll fly them in tandem next to one another. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, they do whole routines. Yeah, they'll do uh, music. You know, they'll set it to music and choreograph and fly them with the music. And neither one of us are good enough to do that. No. But we can take two kites and, and we can kind of keep from crashing them into each other. We're getting that good. <laughs> so, and then I decided it would be kind of fun to make a kite that would just make everybody laugh. And if you recognize, if, if you're a fan of the far side, you'll recognize this is a, a cartoon from the far side. And the, the cartoon is this UFO flying down over a, a New York City street and the street is full of people who are all freaking out and running every which way. And the caption simply re reads, yee-haw. <laughs> <laughs> so, remember that, yeah. So we made this kite and the idea was, you know, if we could get this thing to fly properly, uh, we could put little little pitch pipes in the, in the uh, legs. And so it would make a woo sound as it flew, right? Oh, well, we're God. still working on it because oh. this is oh. the best. This is the best photo we've got yet of that kite in the air, and you can see that the sail, the, the main part of the kite here, is rippling. Um, it'll fold up on itself and come crashing to the ground. Um, you know, it looks more like an Area yeah. Fifty One. How mistake. many strings? Is this four it's, strings too? It's four. Yeah, yeah. We needed four strings in order to be able to control it at all. And are those things that come down? Are they? Those are the landing legs. Yeah, the, those are the oh, landing yeah. legs and they stick straight down. And so the kite, if you're really good, uh, you know, you can actually land it on the legs and then take it back off again. And uh, the problem is I'm still working on this kite, trying to get it to work properly. Um, because it's an oval sail, it's very hard to hold it rigid. You know, it wants to fold up. So uh, it, uh, it's been a very difficult kite and uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to succeed or not. Uh, this, this I is love the, the idea of putting the pipes. Though yeah. having musical, you could, you could, I know you're, you're both musicians too, I believe. Well, and, uh, Kathy's a much more musician than I am. We, we do, we're, we dabble with the guitar. <laughs> and since I'm a techie nerd kind of guy, I build guitars. But uh, <laughs> you fact, build electric guitars? Yes. Yeah, I, He's got one right here. I yes. built, I built this wow. guy. Yeah. Oh <laughs> the thing is, gosh. you know, I built it from a kit, so I, you know, I can't say that I just did it from scratch. But, uh, wow. you know, it, it was a kit, great. and I assembled the pieces and painted it and, and all that, and uh, you know, I can make I can noise with it, it, but I can't say that I play it. <laughs> I could paint it. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, but I yeah. love the idea of putting different, um, like having kites that makes you make music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No doubt. It would be fun, you know, because the wind is blowing past it. You might as well use that wind for something. And, uh, you know, people do, they put little uh, windmills in there and they, they will like use the windmill to like pull something up to the kite. You know, they'll have a string, that, oh. right? And you can run something uh, up to the kite. And then when it gets to the top, it releases and drops back down. <laughs> So yeah, there's an awful lot of fun innovation that goes into kite flying. Yeah, I have heard that you don't some people cut, uh, coat their wires with glass so that oh, they yeah. can <clears throat> they they have cut fighting kite strings. Yeah, yeah, they they have kite fights, and uh, you have about a, a ten foot long section of your string that's coated in, in glass, and you try and rub that across the other guy's string and cut their string and. Uh, you know, the, the winner is the guy whose kite's still flying at the end of the contest. Wow. Wow. Because I think I read somewhere that they were, birds were getting in trouble with that a lot. These glasses. Oh, I read that. There are these two brothers. I think it's India. I want to say India, where this was the, like a big problem where they were rescuing tons of birds <laughs> that had been hurt by oh. the glass. I had not heard about that, but yeah, uh, I hadn't heard that part. I do know that India is really big on kite fighting, mm -hmm. but uh, and so yeah, so they they sense. they started like a, a rescue, a bird rescue. Oh, that's so weird. Yeah, 
I think I read that somewhere too, Elizabeth. It's ringing a bell when you said it. Yeah. The, the thing is, you know, when we're flying kites, um, it's very, very rare that a bird um, will, um, yeah, that will hit, hit the kite or the string. Um, you know, of course, we use a very bright string so you can see it because uh, we want to know what the strings are doing. And, you know, it's funny, kite, kite people, if there's any real kite aficionados, they're hearing me say the word string and they're going, oh, it's the line. It's called the line, not the string. <laughs> you know, but, I'm an amateur. It's a string. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you tell, huh? Amateur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's hilarious. I like that. But yeah, no, I'd heard about that. And it, it quite shocked me, too, because I was like, how how many birds could you get even if you wanted to? That's it. Uh, yeah, you, you, you know, you, you can you get a seagull that's interested sometimes. And, um, you know, you can you can uh, get the seagull is actually trying to check out your kite and you know with a four-line kite you can hold it in place and you let that seagull figure it out and then it'll swoop away you know <laughs> but uh, you know it's it's polite if you see a bird just steer your kite away from it not toward it you know? yeah. yeah definitely well, i guess the other question just to sort of pull everything together and I'll try to anyway is do you find any of that's a stupid question, but do you find any of this stuff able to use it? Do you, is it food for your fiction if you're writing? Um, I have to imagine it is in some level. Yeah, Just actually, sure. interesting. Um, you know, I write a science column for uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction too, and uh, one of my very first columns was on how kites work. You know, what what makes them do what they do. So, uh, you know, right out of the chute, you know, my, one of my very first columns was about my kite flying hobby. Uh, and uh, I don't know, have we- Now, it's to... a science column, right? It's a science column, yeah. And, and, and oh, so oh. is it broad, like science, like you could write about stars or knitting or mm -hmm. telescopes? Anything I want. Anything, right? Absolutely. That's That's right. Right. Yeah, anything I want to. Um, in, in fact, the- uh, the most recent column is about the color blue. And that's how we found out about the uh, Oregon blue color um, that Kathy mentioned in a previous segment. Um, and you know, so I'm just writing about all the technology behind the color blue. And uh, it was fun to research that. I didn't know much about it myself, but I'd, I'd heard about the Oregon blue. Uh, and Have I thought, you ever, there's a book, Sacred Blue, by yes. Christopher Moore. Christopher Moore. Oh, we've both read that. Yes. It's delightful. I love that yeah. book. Yeah, isn't that a great book? I really, I really like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fact, I, I think it was that book that gave me the impetus to, to write about the color blue, actually. Oh. And, uh, you know, and doing the research was where we came across that, um, uh, the new pigment that came out of uh, Oregon State University. I once started a story about artists like taking over uh, uh, they're like scions of military people. So they have some access. And so they start taking over and their, their goal is, you know, they're conquering the countries where all these great, like cobalt would be, or, you know, different colors. They want to uh, get all, you know, they want to, you know, get the color market. <laughs> Very good. I like it. That sounds like a great story. It does. Well, you know, I, uh, I've used right. astronomy in my uh, fiction quite a lot. Um, in fact, one of the most recent stories in Analog Magazine, I think it was in the uh, July, August issue, um, was a time travel story about an astronomer from the future where the light pollution is so bad that you can't really see the stars anymore. Uh, he time travels back into the past to find darker sky. And oh. uh, so the real question is, you know, what, uh, what era would be the best for an amateur astronomer? And uh, I won't spoil the story by saying what era I decided upon, but I think the answer is actually quite surprising. Uh, where, you know, when is the actual best time to be an amateur astronomer? Um, huh. Yeah. Oh, that's, so, that's great. What a great concept. A great it was fun. Yeah. I, I, I call the story the dark ages. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're looking for the best time for dark sky. And uh, dark it, ages would probably be pretty good, wouldn't it? When's that? Wouldn't the dark ages be pretty good? Or yeah, if you don't mind uh, 
plague. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, oh, I see. Okay, for everything. Yeah. You know, it's a whole thing. Yeah. 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 I started out, the guy decided he was going to go back before civilization. He went back like 30,000 years. And, uh, you know, he had a beautiful sky, but he also had a saber toothed tiger that was uh, <laughs> kind of prowling his camp and it, you know it's pretty hard to observe with your telescope when the saber-toothed tiger is like stalking you right so, yeah okay you don't and then the, uh, the uh the september issue of analog got another story of mine that's about the what's called the dart mission it's the uh, it's a mission to actually whack uh asteroid with uh, a, a, a space probe to see if we can change its orbit it's an attempt to, it's kind of a proof of concept thing to see if we can change the orbit of an asteroid when we actually need to. Uh, you know, if one's coming in and uh, going to strike the Earth, we would like to be able to move it aside. And so this uh, DART mission is being sent out there and it's going to whack into this asteroid next month, uh, September 26th. And so I wrote a story about what we might find uh, in those last moments before the probe hit the asteroid, uh, you know, made up a, a, a scenario where that may not be the best thing to do. And uh, the thing was, I had to have it published by the September issue of Analog, right? And I, was, I came up with the idea last December, and I know the pipeline for uh, publication is pretty long. And I, I emailed the editor, Trevor, and uh, I asked him, you know, could you conceivably get the story into the September issue if I were to go ahead and write it? And he wrote back and said, yeah, go for it. And so I took two weeks to write a 10,000 word story, sent it off to him, and he liked it well enough to put it in the pipeline and expedite it. And it just came out in the September issue. I got my author's copy oh, today. Great. So, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if anybody even takes notice, but uh, you know, I'm hoping that it'll be a fun story for people and then they can watch the actual impact and see if what I predicted comes true. Which, um, Should we hope for that or <laughs> not hope for that? <laughs> um, well, it's such a wild speculation. No, I, I did such a wild speculation. I think the odds of it being true are almost zero, but not quite. <laughs> a civilization on the asteroid that you're describing? Yeah. Well, not quite a full civilization, but yeah, something we didn't expect. <laughs> so, and, uh, wow. you know, yeah, it was the whole concept is about whether, you know, is the solar system actually a safe place for life or not? You know, there's asteroids flying around all over the place and they whack into the earth every now and then. Um, but we haven't been whacked for 65 million years. The last really good whack was the one that killed the dinosaurs. And you got to wonder why? Why haven't we been hit more often? And I've answered that question. Oh no! Nice. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, oh. Get our 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 analogs out. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Really. Well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun, and we didn't even scratch the surface. Well, we didn't scratch the surface on a lot of stuff, and we hardly <laughs> we didn't even mention music like that much. And I know that's yeah. also. But yeah. all those ideas. Okay, one last question. Two last questions. One last okay. question for Kathy. Do you ever use your your your? You know, you work in a lab. You're working mm -hmm. with microscopes and analyzing. You know, super little stuff. Do you use that in your fiction? Have you? I have that? used. Yeah, I've, I've used. Uh, maybe not necessarily uh, microscopic work, but I have used my lab uh, experiences in fiction before. Um, <clears throat> one that uh, it, it was working in the toxicology lab. I, I sold a story to Analog um, that talks about why uh, a perfectly normal analyzer uh, testing samples for toxicology, uh, sam you know, for uh, elements, uh, why it would refuse to, you know, to sample this one sample. And, you know, you find out that uh, for one thing, that sample, is an autopsy sample. It's not from a living person. Uh, but you know, what, why and how and what's going on, it's definitely a Halloween kind of story, but it's set in the toxicology lab. And I'm trying to think, what else have I done with the... Uh, I'm not sure, that might be that's, the only That's one. the big one that I did was yeah. with lab work, but... Uh, 
do you, you know, guys like, both find yourself well, and when you write together it'd be good but do you both find yourself like going well but that could never you know happen in a real world kind of thing well that's kind of yeah, the fun you thing you know like when you're writing fiction don't behave that way yeah when you're writing fiction you know that's kind of the fun thing you think well that could never happen and then you write you think well how could i make it happen mm -hmm. how could i make it seem plausible exactly you know? And that's where the fun comes in. Oh, yeah. Okay. And one last question for both of you. Uh, what piece of advice would you give your younger self? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I would go back in time and just have a conversation with my younger self and go, huh, 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 all the time. <laughs> and I think that would be more effective than, you know, just telling myself, turn down the damn music. But I damaged my hearing pretty badly when I was a teenager, and I've you know I've been wearing hearing aids pretty much ever since. And so it's like, yeah, I'd go back in time and tell myself, take better care of your hearing, <laughs> <laughs> which is yeah. probably not not you know most people think, oh you know life choice you know you 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 need to do this one thing just right. And it's like no, just take better care of your hearing. That would be my thing. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think for me, I would just go back and tell myself. You know, food really is good. It tastes really great. Just stop eating meat and potatoes. Right. Start eating the other things. <laughs> Kathy it's was not a, going to kill you. <laughs> Kathy was a picky eater, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it just my, my mom would say something was a vegetable and was like, nope, <laughs> not passing these lips. <laughs> we've become total foodies now. We go out, we eat out a lot and we try and find things we've not eaten before. Uh, oh, I know, love to experiment with yeah, food. It's, uh, life is short, you know, live it up. <laughs> live it up, exactly. And that's also a good piece of advice, generally. Life is short, live it up. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so we always end with the best thing we learned this week. And I'm going to have a little short one, which is that tigers in Nepal have come back from the brink of extinction and they're 190% in, in just a couple of years. So, That's yeah. Is that so. COVID related? I mean, a couple years. It's like, is it because people sort of. Oh. COVID well, also, and also some protections, uh, you know, protections yeah. that were put in place that have been really effective. You know, sometimes all you have to do is say, why don't you just stop killing everything? And then, <laughs> wow, <laughs> the population comes back, you know? That's sometimes it. it's really not rocket science. <laughs> yep. That's true. Um, I'm going to say mine, because as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have time to really write anything down ahead of time today. Um, I think the best thing I learned this week is that I should have more hobbies and I should spend more time on my hobbies because the two of you are so inspiring and you, you have such a, a joie de vie about you. You both just, yeah, your relationship's lovely. You just support one another and you look like you just have so much fun. And now I want to, too. Oh, oh good. Good, well, good. I'm, Absolutely. Glad, I'm glad we could yeah. serve as a positive example. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the list, and, and when you guys go, as I'm sure you will, to check out the list of books and everything, you'll just see this list of stuff that's not, you know, the telescopes and the knitting and the kites and music, which we didn't touch on that much, but just like, yeah. Yeah, go, creativity go and creativity and curiosity. Those are my two work takeaways. Cool. Wonderful. So, yeah. so yeah, this was yeah. fun. And also, thank you very, very much, they have Maria. Their, they have to tell their best things. That's right. Kathy's got That's one. Right. I do. I do. I just, I just discovered that uh, researchers have found a way to use genetically engineered bacteria to transform plastic bottles into vanilla flavoring. Now, <laughs> yeah, it's like, but that's a great way to get rid of some of this plastic that's sitting around. Uh, it's not been approved. You know, uh, further studies needed. It's not been approved for you know human consumption. But vanilla is used in a lot of other things besides just flavoring. But I thought vanilla bottles. That's cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> great. What what else is it used in besides flavoring? Just uh, specific... there's no. uh, it's used in cosmetics and uh -huh. um, I can't remember what all else. Soaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, lotions. Think of it. All the stuff that smells good. Yeah. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't right. know if I want to eat That's it. Great. <laughs> so I learned something interesting about a lake just up the uh, up the road from us. It's only about 40 miles away from us uh, in Oregon Cascades. It's called Waldo Lake. It is a lake that does not have any streams flowing into it. It's all fed just by snow melt and um, apparently groundwater uh, percolating up. And so it doesn't have minerals flowing into it the way a stream would carry minerals into it. And so it's largely such pure water. It is such pure water that not much grows there. And uh, if you want fish in that lake, you have to stock them. And uh, yeah, they, so there's, uh, there's almost no fish in this lake and there's no algae blooms. There's no, uh, no bugs, um, wow. mosquitoes, there's a lot of mosquitoes. But the interesting thing about it is you can shine a light down from a boat in the middle of that lake and see the bottom of the lake. It is the clearest water. Um, I mean, it, it's just amazingly clear. And it's because it doesn't have any streams flowing into it. It's the most interesting thing I've discovered this week. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. That is interesting. Uh, How deep is it about? Um, it's not terrifically deep, uh, three, 300 feet, something like that. But yeah, you can see like 300 feet down into the water. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. It is. it is. Yeah, stunning. That's pretty deep to see down. Yeah. Yeah. But, Oregon also has Crater Lake, which is essentially the same thing. It doesn't have any streams flowing into it either. And Crater Lake is also really clear. I'm, I'm not sure how deep you can see into it. No, but it's got the most beautiful blue color I've ever seen in any kind of lake. Right. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Trip to Oregon. Trip yeah, to Oregon. yeah. Trip to Oregon. Road trip, road trip. I'm ready. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It, is a, sure. it is a beautiful state. We, we moved out here. State. We moved out here 33 years ago from Wyoming and uh, we fell in love with Oregon. It's like, no, this is home. This is, this is where we're gonna spend the rest of our lives. And oh, cool. that's why we're still here. That's love wonderful. It. Well, thank you so much for sharing all these amazing different things with us and joining them all together. Well, thanks and for having also, us. Our pleasure. And also thank you, Maria Korloff for directing us and Alex Korloff for editing us. And thank you to Metastellar, the magazine for being our sponsors, basically. Uh, they bring us to you and Metastellar is an online magazine and it publishes original science fiction, horror and fantasy for people who don't know about it. There is a link below. And we would love it if you enjoyed the video to like it, leave us any comments you'd like to leave us and sign up, you know, hit the um, notification button so that you will get notified when we have new episodes. So it's uh, subscribing to the channel. That will give you the notifications. If you want to help Metastellar publish new stories, you can visit our Patreon page and donate to the cause. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Jerry and Kathy. It was so much fun. It was oh, indeed. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>